Today I'm excited to have Clayton King join us. Clayton is the president of Crossroads Worldwide. He's a teaching pastor at New Spring Church in Anderson, South Carolina. He's the campus pastor at Liberty University. He speaks in churches and camps all over the place. He's written six books, including the one we're gonna focus on today, which is 12 questions to ask before you marry. He's married to Shari and has two sons, Jacob and Joseph. And more than that, he's becoming a good friend and it's great to sit here with you today and spend time. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about talking about this kind of subject matter. It's very important. Absolutely. Let's just kind of start off and talk a little bit about the status of marriage in our culture today. You know, I've been married at this point for a little over 13 years, and my mom and dad were married for almost 50 years before my mom passed away. To say that marriage has changed in America would be a, a tremendous understatement. I think that when I think about marriage, I think about the bedrock institution that our culture is built on. It's been that way since the beginning of human history. But when I read the statistics of what people think about and what they say about marriage today in America, it's kind of breathtaking. Uh, I, I would never have dreamed even 15 years ago when I began dating my wife that Americans would look at marriage the way they see it now. For instance, uh, several recent surveys that I have read have said that about 40% of Americans, adults, think that the uh, traditional institutional idea of marriage is outdated and irrelevant. Um, whenever I myself travel and talk to people one-on-one -on -one in airports, airplanes, and restaurants, it seems like the whole idea of committing your life to one person for a lifetime has become passe. It's something that people don't even feel um, is a necessity for a happy life anymore. And I think probably what um, takes me uh, back the most is the fact that people are so flippant about relationships in general. Uh, whereas my parents' generation thought of marriage as a good and honorable commitment you made to someone else for the sake of your spouse and for the sake of your children, it seems like today there's been sort of a subtle shift that marriage is not about being good to or serving another person. Marriage is not about procreation, having children and preparing them for a life that will help humanity. But the mentality now is that marriage is about self-fulfillment. Uh, it's about having your needs met. And I think that's one of the reasons maybe why people feel like if a marriage doesn't work out, you just walk away from it. And maybe one of the main reasons why people are delaying marriage in the first place and getting married later. So the state of marriage in America today is a lot different than it was even a decade ago. I think so, and I think the focus, we're so self-focused, self-centered, selfishness I think plays a big part in it. And so if I'm always trying to get my needs met, I'm not considering someone else and not, and not taking that opportunity and not seeing that as an opportunity to join with someone else and to walk through life together and that life really can be better that way than going through it alone. And uh, in the same study that I read, um, never before in American history have so many adults lived alone. Right now, according to the, uh, to the study that I heard and read about, uh, NPR reported this, that about 20 to 25% of American adults are now living alone. And the reasons that they gave uh, were varied. Uh, many of these adults said, I'm living alone because it's cheaper. Some of them said, I'm living alone because uh, I don't want the stress and the pressure of a long-term relationship. Uh, many of them were living alone because they said, it's too much work to live with another person. If I'm by myself, I can just do things my way and I don't ever have to worry about offending anybody or making anybody angry. And it does, to me, pull back the curtain a little bit and, and show us that as a culture, maybe we are becoming a little more selfish and a little less concerned about others and their well-being and a little more concerned about ourselves. And so that's one reason why my wife and I are passionate about helping folks who are getting married or who are already married or maybe thinking about it to approach it in the right way and to think through a lot of these dynamics because once you find yourself in the relationship of marriage, it's much more difficult to ask those tough questions than if you were to ask them before you tie the knot. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think you and I both believe is that God put a, a desire for intimacy within us. It's certainly intimacy with Him, but then the marriage relationship, the desire for intimacy there. And so that 
with the choices we're seeing people make, that's not being fulfilled yeah. at all. Yeah, and, and at, the end of the, at the end of the day, I've traveled in 35 countries, and so whether I'm in Malaysia or India, whether I'm in Kenya or Russia, uh, no matter what language a person speaks or what kind of food they eat or even what kind of religion they ad adhere to, people are wired for connection with other people. Nobody really wants to live alone. Even the people who do live alone still have social connection through Facebook or through Twitter or social networking. And so in our culture now, it looks like people are substituting real live relationships with humans who have skin and bones with virtual relationships with people online. And, and I'm not against those. I'm on Facebook and Twitter myself. But there will never, ever be a real true substitute for that one-on-one -on -one personal connection with people that you love, friends, uh, a mate, your children, your parents, uh, family members. And I think that God has hardwired us. It's in our DNA to need that. I do too. And I think the social media, if we see that just as an addition to real relationships, to face-to-face -face relationships, to marriage relationships, then that's okay. If we put everything, all our stock in those kind of relationships, then we've got to avoid there. I think it's not going to be met. It's true. And as a, as a man who has recently gone through the death of my mom and placing my father in assisted living, there are certain times in your life where a virtual relationship, um, a virtual friendship will not help you. You need somebody to be there physically. You need someone to help you move a piece of furniture. You need someone to take care of your kids. Uh, we have two small children in my home. So that is uh, one of the practical reasons why I believe that God wired us for relationship. And that is just that we help each other. And, and there's no one in your life, uh, unless God has given you the gift and called you to be single, there's no one who will love you and help you and stick with you longer and more faithfully than a spouse. Even as you grow up, you know, a lot of folks thought, think my mom's always there for me. And my mom was always there for me being adopted. Uh, my mom and I had a very uh, wonderful relationship, but because she was a good deal older than me, her life ended before mine did. And so that, that one relationship of the husband and wife is the one that will carry us from you know, late adolescence or early adulthood into the twilight years of our life. And I feel like so many people don't get to experience that joy because they don't do the hard work prior to their marriage of figuring out who they are before they figure out what they want in a marriage. And unfortunately, I think that's why so many people now have a negative mindset about marriage. They see marriage portrayed in Hollywood or on um, the movies or on a TV screen in, in a certain way that makes them fear that commitment because if it doesn't work out, I don't want to be wounded. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to carry that baggage around with me for the rest of my life. But marriage is risk. And the greater the risk, the greater the reward. And you are taking a big risk when you commit the rest of your adult life to another person. But when you stick with it, and by God's grace, you stay together, the benefits long-term are just unbelievable. And I watched my mom and dad uh, in their late 50s and their 60s as their marriage went into a brand new territory of love and affection and care for one another. And that's really what I want. And, and that's what I want my friends to have too. You know, we see a lot of statistics. One of them that really troubles me is one I saw recently, and that is the fact that there are more divorces in the first year of marriage now than there ever have been. And so when you're talking about your parents and, and couples that we see go through the different stages of life, and then they go through the twilight years together, so many couples are giving up early on. And so they're either not asking the right questions first, or they're just giving themselves that option from day one of this really doesn't work out, I can get out. It's, and it's really sad because it seems like um, the phrase I'm hearing thrown around a lot right now is starter marriage. If the first one doesn't work out, I'll scrap it and I may start over again, or I may just play the field, or I may just not ever even prioritize marriage. Um, when a person is selfish, and we all are, myself first and foremost, when our selfishness desires something that only benefits us, when you live in a culture that constantly tells you and reaffirms to you that you should get whatever you want, that you deserve whatever desires you currently have, then it goes against the grain of our selfish nature to commit to a relationship with the anticipation that it's gonna last a lifetime. And one of the things that we talked about in our book is that the way you date is the way you'll marry. So if, 
if I'm having multiple dating relationships over the course of a two or three year time period in high school or in college or uh, early on in my professional career, if I'm dating and breaking up and dating and breaking up, if I'm hooking up with different people, if I'm meeting people at bars and clubs and I'm going to outings and I'm meeting people just for the sole fact of them meeting my personal needs, helping me with my insecurities, once the newness wears off of a new relationship, all of us who are married know that wears off pretty soon. It's at that point that our selfishness says, just scrap this, find somebody else. If you could find the right person, you'd be happy. What that does to a culture is it collectively over time undermines the very moral fabric of a culture. Marriage is about self-sacrifice. Marriage is about prioritizing someone else's needs and giving to them and serving them before you are served. So over the course of generations, if that moral fabric is somehow um, shredded, then the culture itself suffers. And I believe we're beginning to see a lot of that in America right now. We see that in our children. We see that in our public schools. We see that uh, in problems with addictions. Um, the surveys that I've read and the studies that I've done, even in preparing for a sermon that I recently preached, are staggering that about 80% of children in elementary and middle school who have behavioral problems come from a home where mom and dad are not living together. Uh, the, the number of teen pregnancies, if a girl is pregnant as a teenager, there's a 70% chance that she came from a home uh, where the father was gone or absent. And, and, in, and in some cases, uh, I have met people who, who will actually admit to me everything that's wrong with me right now, in their 20s or 30s, is a result of the emotional confusion that I grew up in, grew up in, in the home environment, of not knowing if my mom and dad were going to make it, of listening to them fight late at night, and then blaming myself. So my prayer is that we uh, can turn the tide and that we can help people prior to marriage or even early on in marriage think about the real crucial and critical questions that they need to be asking about themselves first and about their spouse second. And to see, as you mentioned, the, the ripple effect of a divorce. It's of so much more than just a man and a woman getting divorced, how many other people it can affect. And certainly if there's children involved, the effect that, that happens to the children. My, so. my wife comes from a home where um, her mom, dad, and stepdad collectively there are eight marriages and divorces in my wife's story, in her personal story, which is something that she dealt with and has worked with and is still working through. But we're able now to take that experience and try to help people who have gone through that, especially the children who are affected by divorce. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.